So, and you can see here if they use this uh, pesticide, the aluminum phosphide, depending on what you use, you have also different uh, rates. Uh, also, we have the Bing surfactant, and uh, they are using again for empty space, and again it's for uh, volume, not for the weight of the of the space or of the of the of the of the grains. Uh, one of the things that people uh, ask me when they when I came here is that so they go and they are trying to sell their grains. What they should do if they found some grains, some some insects there. So the question is that if they should use any of these insecticides before they sell it. And the answer is that usually most of these products are used for storage, but you need to be aware uh, if this product that you're selling is going to be used immediately or it's going to be storage. So and depending on that, it's going to be the, the, the application of the insecticide you are using. So again, here we have another products that are used directly into the grain. These are grain protectants. And you have here uh, the rates for uh, the small grains. And also, in most cases, they are used for, for, the, uh, for weight. Uh, and in these cases, you have Sentinel, Daikon, D, that's an insect growth regulator that they are used for the a, a thousand bushels, except by insecto, that is your use per ton. So per ton of the of the of the insecticide you are using. Something that is important is that you need to rotate your products as, as you do that on field crops, and that's going to reduce the uh, resistance on these insects. So this year when I was going to, to collect the samples, uh, some of the farmers told me that they're using one, uh, one product and they're, they're, they, it seems that they're showing some resistance. So that's something that we need to deal also. Uh, um, there's, one, there's a couple of products that are specific for Indian meal moth that are there and, uh, and, uh, and that these treatments are applied to the top of the silos, so and then you need to mix that with the grain. So this is to avoid that the, the moth go into the into the into the storage grain. So as I mentioned before, uh, we did a sampling of uh, grains from uh, here Caldwell County and Lyon County, and that's what we have. So we have uh, in Caldwell County we have a uh, corn that was white corn, uh, uh, yellow corn, uh, and uh, wheat, different types of grains. So uh, we found in Carwell County that there was a commercial wheat and there was a cool wheat. And then for the, different, for the second site, we have wheat that was fumigated on September and another one that was fumigated on March. And that was very, very interesting because it provides some information here. Uh, besides that, uh, in Lyon County, we have some yellow corn and also wheat. And um, I was surprised for the result, for these results, because it seems that uh, growers here are doing a good, good work. So I, mean, so I, I, ha I was, I was expecting to find more insects. So we did, we went to the, to the, to the silos. We took samples of these uh, uh, different uh, uh, grains, and we put this in a two in a containers like that, and we put volumes of two, two, two hundred. Uh, milliliters so and we stored that for one month and during that month we were counting what was happening there so because uh, initially we have a, a number of alive ones but they were they, it's possible that some of the grains have uh, insects inside the grains so we did that for one month and what I'm going to show you is the numbers of insects that uh, we found on this uh, on these uh, uh, samples So this is a first for, for wheat. Uh, let me see, I make a mistake here. Yeah. Uh, for wheat, we have the site one and site two and site three. And then uh, we are not using here, here the data that we found the, for the fumigated in March versus the fumigated on September. So and you can see that uh, we only found 11 flat beetles, one ant, and there was uh, uh, also one weevil. 
So based on these percentages, the most common was the 78% was uh, the, the flat beetles. And in the second site, there were weevils and flat beetles half and a half. However, the numbers, I believe, they are really low. Uh, on the third side, we didn't find any insects. So that, I think that was uh, interesting for me. It means that they are doing a good job here, uh, at least storing the grains. Were these grains treated when they went into the bins? Yeah, they were treated before. So and this is what, uh, that for me, this is uh, very interesting. So because this is what, uh, uh, it, 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 it makes sense of the treatment. So especially on wheat. Uh, so this uh, first sample was fumigated on, on, on uh, September and the, the second uh, group was fumigated on March. And you can see the big differences between those two groups. So we have uh, 110 uh, insects found in the first group, whereas the ones that were fumigated in March, we only found 10. So this is a preliminary sampling that I'm doing. But I believe that this is important uh, to do this kind of treatment so for, for storage grain. So uh, I'm not so sure yet, I mean, uh, when you sell the grains, what's the amount of, uh, of, 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 of insects that you can find in, on, on how the sample is done to, to, sell, to, 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 to sell these grains. But I believe that uh, I think this data is important. So if you are storing wheat, you need probably to spray twice to reduce the number of insects that you have there. So uh, another thing that I'm going to talk to you is about uh, uh, a study that I'm doing right now. But uh, first of all, I'm going to sh tell you about uh, what this field that you are seeing here. So this is a field where we are trying to study what are the effects of uh, controlling uh, aphids, doing the standard preventive spray that you do here. So you come, it comes, uh, uh, I know that some people do some spray during the fall and some spray during the spring. So in this case, we haven't done the fall spring, the, the fall spray, but we have done in this field the standard spray that you use pyrethroids. So in this field, we have a wheat that was uh, treat, seed treated, and then there were two varieties that were, uh, one variety that was not treated at all. So and this one is replicated on that side, but so far, because we don't find the numbers of aphids that are necessary for treatment, we have not applied it. So independent of that, probably I'm going to spray half of the plot with uh, insecticides soon and the other one I'm going to leave that without insecticides because I think it doesn't require the treatment but I'm going to see what's the effect on the yield. Just to let you know, uh, talking with colleagues on, uh, from Kansas, I mean, uh, they also have the similar problems that you have here. The only insecticides that you are registered here for controlling aphids are pyrethroids. So my colleague was suggesting that he is going to remove all these insecticides from the, from the uh, manuals for, for, for the University of Kansas, because uh, he believes that the natural enemies are most likely uh, prevent uh, the explosion of population of aphids. <laughs> maybe that's possible, maybe not, I mean, but, but for sure, uh, Aphids induce in many insects the increase of uh, fertiliz fertilization. This is called hormoligosis. On, on uh, spider mites, it was found that when you spray a a pyrethroids, in, because these are not used to killing spider mites, they're used to kill insects, uh, these, these uh, pyrethroids uh, increase the, the, the number of eggs laid by the spider mites. This is called hormoligosis. So that's also demonstrated for uh, neonicotinoids on, on when they are used in, um, in tree in urban, urban areas. But uh, independent of that, what we found here was that there were two fields. One was in Logan County and the other was in Hopkinsville. So the, these two, two fields, especially the Logan County that why I was following, it has probably at the beginning maybe uh, more than 100, probably 500 aphids per feet of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of wheat than when we sample. 
So when I was there, the uh, grower told me that they treated already that grain with pyrethroid during the fall twice, and they treated already twice with pyrethroids during the uh, spring. So it's possible that these aphids have developed resistance to the uh, to the to the pyrethroid. It's possible that. Now there are two types of resistance on aphids. One is an enzym enzymatic resistance that can be broke by another by a product. And uh, we, I went and I, I bought a pro that product. But when we tried to use it in the field, most of the aphids were gone. So in two weeks, all the aphids were gone. So what happened is that you see these white spots here on this aphid. So these are uh, fungus. This is a entomopathogenic fungus that kill the aphids. So we brought these aphids to the laboratory. We were trying to have a colony with these aphids to see if there is resistance. So far, we were able, able to do that because when we are separating the aphids, even the small nymphs that are new, born in the lab, they are killed by the, by the, by the fungus. So as you can see, this is uh, when we put the, the aphids, one day later, because we have still some high humidity, the aphid is completely killed. Now, there is a, a reasons for, for this uh, uh, abundance of this entomopathogenic fungus in, uh, in, in this, year, this year, because we have a high humidity compared to previous years. Uh, but, uh, uh, we don't need to discard the natural enemies all the way. So it's, it's this, this year actually we have this issue. So, but not only that, in these fields we are not only finding uh, this fungus, we are finding a lot of uh, natural enemies, parasitoids, especially parasitoids. What the parasitoids do, they go and they lay the eggs on a second or third instar nymph of the aphid. So they don't lay the eggs on these big ones, but they lay, lay the eggs on the small ones. And then when they lay the eggs, the eggs start to hatch inside the body of the insect. And then the, the wasps start to developing and then it came out. It usually turned this color brownish. And later you can see a lot of these ones with this small hole. So. Uh, this time, I'm not going to show you the data because we are finishing this study uh, probably this week. But during the field day uh, on May the 9th, I'm going to have data that provides a lot of information on that. So, and we did this uh, on replicate uh, uh, counts of, of aphids and so on. So just to let you know here, I, mean, I'm, I have here, if you don't believe me, I have this uh, sample from, from, from this area. And you can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, parasitoids inside this, this uh, 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 shoe box. Don't open, please, because, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, there are a lot of aphids. When we brought these plants to the lab, probably we put in small tents and we found probably maybe 1,000 or more on six plants that we brought into the lab. So I know that this is something that doesn't happen year after year, but it occurred this year. So I mean, uh, and I, I know also that this is not a phenomenon that happened uh, across all the places, but it's at least it's, it's happening in Christian County and in Logan County this year. So I don't know yet what species is that, but uh, in, uh, well, when I was in Texas, we were working with a student with a, with a sugar cane aphid and, and over there, the, 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 the environment is really dry. So we found that these uh, aphids that were sprayed, this, this fungus that were sprayed in the field, reduced the population probably 30 to 40%. Not that much, but they reduced the population. Uh, so any question about the aphids and the fungus? How long does it take for the natural predators to kill the aphids? Probably, I mean, in four days, they are going to be dead. But the fungus really it kills probably in two days. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I was working with people with from Wheat Tech. These are the ones that they call me, and 
I'm talking about this, especially about the, the behavior of these parasitoids, because when I went to see them, they didn't know how this system works. And maybe most of you know that how this system works. But I mean, uh, some of the scout, scouts that were, I was talking, they were kind of surprised by this type of behavior. That's what I want to, to let you know. Uh, and um, so this is something that it occurred this year. Maybe the next year is not going to happen. We need to treat with insecticides, but this is something that occurs. Um, another thing that it's important in this field that you are seeing here is that we have some uh, pheromone traps, as you can see here. There is a, this is a, a, a prototype of the firm of the Texas trap that we use commonly. You can see a trap there. That trap is for army worms. And uh, there is a, another trap for, for uh, black cat worms, uh, corn earworm. So there are something like a six, seven different traps here that uh, uh, every every week we publish the number of aphids on the Kentucky Pest News. So you can be aware of what's happening here. So we have these uh, these traps here, and then there's another set of traps in Lexington. So this is going to give us an idea when are we going to have a pest um, in Kentucky. Um, um, this year uh, we are trying uh, we are trying this new trap. Uh, we had two two of these traps. This is called a C trap. Uh, this is a trap that uh, very similar to this is for corn earworm. The insect goes inside and it sap, and this information is sent directly through the web. So we don't need to come and count every week. So. They are not selling this trap yet, but the price of this trap is uh, we are renting, I think, two, two traps for uh, $600 per year. Uh, but uh, one thing that we, we, are going, we are doing this because uh, we have here the common corn earworm traps that we are going to see how effective are these compared to the other ones because the the vendors of these traps can, play, can say that this really replicate what we have here. But what happens if um, we have any other insect different than the, than the, than the corn worm comes here and it's sap? And we are not so sure they count all these, these insects also. Okay? So with the data that we collect here, for example, is, uh, we have right now a lot of uh, corn earworms. No, um, the, 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 the army worms. Uh, last week we have a 300 uh, uh, army worms in that in that trap, and that that provides uh, information on the high activity that these uh, that these moths are having in the fields. So I hear also these uh, caterpillars are flying on different field crops, and most likely uh, based on this information on the accumulated degree days that we have on historical information. Probably for next, by the end of this week, you may need to start uh, searching for the uh, um, army worms, uh, caterpillars in your fields. I think that's all the information that I have uh, for you today.